uh, increase money and credit or monetization by 2% of GDP. So I think people are just a little surprised that they joined the party and announced it early. Um, I think uh, you're going to see uh, in their secrecy laws uh, what they're going to do in order to continue to do the business that they're doing in banking for others in, in other countries is that when requested, they will throw some of the smaller fish with one or two million dollars to the taxing authorities in Europe and the United States to keep them shut up and make it look like they're doing something when they're going to protect the bigger accounts of hundreds of millions, sometimes billions of dollars. And I think that's what they're up to in order to slide through this thing. And I think when that becomes evident, what's going to happen is that uh, the, the franc will uh, get stronger again. Uh, and if I continue to hold Swiss bonds, will they retain their value after the expected uh, collapse of the dollar? And the, relatively so, the answer is yes. But you've got to remember that the most important place to be is in gold and silver coins and shares. And people who are in any kind of government bonds should really be rethinking about moving that money into gold and silver related assets. And the same goes for annuities and life policies that have cash values, uh, CDs that are in savings and loans or credit unions or banks. All of that stuff should be moved. And that's what's going on all over the world. And you're still getting in early. Believe me, uh, there may come a time a year or two from now when it might be almost impossible to get coins. So you think about that. Uh, how long do you expect the foreign bankers to be able to hold off doomsday? I'd say a couple of years. And then it's going to get very nasty once inflation is topped out. It could be longer. It could be three years. But we're in that time frame. And don't forget, they're going to have a war or an extension of the war that they already have in a big way. And they're also going to pull the plug when they feel like it. And we don't know when that is. And I don't think they do either. I think they're playing it by ear. And they're getting a lot more uh, uh, problems than they had envisioned. And um, uh, all is not going well for them. Um, last question, and this is off these kinds of subjects, and I'm going to go over it quickly. Uh, was JFK a friend of sound money? And basically, yes. I have read conflicting statements about his role in America coming off the silver standard. Some say he was assassinated because he wanted to have the U.S. mint, mint its own coins as the Constitution authorizes. And that's true, incidentally. Others may have him actually hurting sound money principles, though, through his executive order relating to silver. My opinion is he was trying to do the right thing, and he wanted to do away with the Fed and the CIA, and that's what got him killed. Uh, maybe Kennedy was different. I, I think he was. Um, I, I think, you know, he had that socialist streak, which was, you know, trying to help others, because, you know, if you grow up in an immigrant neighborhood, even though your family is one of beans. Uh, you're around a lot of people who are the same group that you are who have nothing. And so he had a great deal of empathy for people in that category. I can't say that for his younger brother, who I know, Teddy, who's in the process of dying. I knew Teddy when I was a kid. And I knew the family very well, although I never knew Jack at all. And Joe died when I was seven years old, so I never came across him. He got killed in the Pacific on a PT. No, was it? I don't know how he got killed, but anyway, he was killed in the war. And um, uh, I was a caddy for the Kennedy family for several years. So I knew Joe and his wife and the two girls very, very well. And so I knew the family quite well. And uh, Joe was one nasty, grumpy old guy. And... Um, 
and uh, I got stuck with him because I was the best caddy. <laughs> and he wouldn't take anything less than having the best. That's the way Joe was. Anyway, um, could you explain just how there could be so much debt in the world? Well, it's easy. They just create it. I guess what I'm getting at is how can J.P. Morgan have $200 trillion in derivative debts? Well, they make the rules and they do what they want. And that's what the problem is. Uh, they're running roughshod over the public of the world. And um, it's going to uh, end in, in no good fashion, believe me. Melody, take it away. Well, thank you, Bob. <laughs> Here's a question then. Citibank reported a profit for January and February 2009. As a result, the Dow went up 379 points and nearly 10% for the week. Following this, other banks said that they would be giving back millions in bailout money. Frankly, he is relieved to see this because it gives the listeners time to prepare for what lies ahead. Do you think this is a head fake, and what are they trying to accomplish from this manipulation? Well, they're trying to make the market go up, number one. And... Um and they're lying, uh, like they always do. And uh, they'll post earnings, but you got to say to yourself, how can you have earnings when you've taken almost a hundred billion dollars from the Federal Treasury and the Federal Reserve to stay in business? The bank is bankrupt. They're lying, and they wanted a rally. They knew how important 6,600 was on the Dow, and they saw the S&P breakdown as well. Uh, the uh, NASDAQ was stronger than it should have been, uh, probably because of the technology stocks. So um, it's a scam. I mean, Jamie Dimon come up and said, if everything, everybody does their part, uh, we'll be out of this by the end of the year. Last year in February, he said by June, uh, we'll be out of this thing. Well, he's been wrong. And, you know, these guys, they, they don't know right from wrong. They're sociopaths. All they'd want to do is make billions of dollars and screw everybody else. And take it from me, I, I was there for 28 years, and I've been into this thing for 50 years, the financial end of things in the world, and uh, I know of whence I speak, and that's their attitude. There was an interview, I don't know if it was today or yesterday, about gold. They were interviewing a gentleman, and this question said, he doesn't think that people should be putting their money into gold to preserve their wealth or to make money. That he should actually be putting it into these companies so they can generate jobs. I mean, it was just like that's what they're trying to make people believe, and that is just part of all the conditioning. And, uh, I mean, I, I couldn't even believe a question like that came out of somebody's mouth. But um, Well, you got to remember that in the old days they used to have human sacrifices to the gods. And that was supposed to bring good fortune. It's the same thing. No different. This question is, uh, Queen Elizabeth owns a controlling interest in HSBC Bank and others as well. Which other banks does she own a controlling interest in? Coots, uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland, Stantanda. Uh, those are big holdings. And she's one of the owners of the Federal Reserve System, along with a handful of other Europeans. Is her controlling interest in other banks a secret? No, I think it's generally known. And nobody thinks anything of it. Their fortune is probably, oh, I could guess offhand, but maybe a hundred, two hundred billion. It's incredible wealth. Uh, their wealth is just unbelievable. I mean, they own a state after a state after a state, uh, just in the British Isles and castles and, and just enormous amounts of uh, of money and power. And she's had, uh, the head of the Illuminati. Well, this gal was talking to the Royal Bank of Canada about her interest in HSBC, and uh, she says that uh, they told her that they were aware that the Queen owns Royal Bank of Scotland, but that she did not have a controlling interest in HSBC. They said that the Queen is not rich enough. Well, I don't know about not rich enough, but yeah. uh, she does own a piece of it. And um, Jardine Matheson was another company, uh, which was uh, that and HSBC were the prime movers in the drug trade during the early 1800s. And, of course, they, you know, owned a big piece of both of them. And there, there were many, many a 
American privateers during that time period who worked on contract for the British from uh, New England, New York, Penn, uh, and Philadelphia, and they used their ships to bring uh, drugs from India to China. And uh, that was uh, the beginning of uh, some of the greatest fortunes that were ever built, not only in Europe, but in, in New England and New York and Pennsylvania as well. And uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's the Leverett's and the Stalton Stalls and the Cabot's and the Lodges and the Rockefellers and the Forbes and Schwab. They were all involved. And just go back in their history and you'll 